It's great to be with you this morning. Did you know that since January the 1st, 2013, there have been over 1,800 mass shootings in this country? And a mass shooting, by definition, is four or more victims, not including the shooter. Since the beginning of this year, there have been more than seven mass shootings already. And many people are asking, why? Why is this happening? And how did we get to this point? Many people are trying to point fingers at the guns, saying, well, guns are the problem. But really, guns are not the problem. The problem is America is losing her morality. Now, the word morality refers to principles of right and wrong behavior. And today I want to consider the morality that Jesus Christ gave to the human family. Many of you might have heard of the new morality of the hedonist, of the godless pleasure seekers. It's something that we call situation ethics. Well, if it feels good, do it. But you know, this code of conduct is neither new and it certainly is not moral. It's just an old immorality wrapped in a different cloak. The code of moral conduct that was introduced by Jesus Christ is completely 100% new. It was a system never before known by man and is quite different from any previous one. And it's the only code of conduct that can get our country back on track again. Now to appreciate Christ's morality, we first have to acquaint ourselves with the world that Jesus Christ had to deal with when he was living on this earth. So I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Now among the Jews, there was this cold, heartless legalism that prevailed among them. Now I want you to notice how Paul actually chastised the Jews for their hypocrisy in his letter to the Romans. And I want you to notice with me, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul is speaking to the Jews, and he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. They were condemning people for certain things that they were doing, but turning around doing the exact same thing. They were nothing but hypocrites. In verse 23, notice he says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? They didn't realize that what they were doing was actually dishonoring God. The entire 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew contains Jesus' scathing rebuke toward Pharisaic Judaism. Woe after woe has been heaped upon these religious leaders who had made their religion as, in, as whited sepulchers. They looked very beautiful on the outside, but inwardly they're full of dead men's bones. And to such pretenders, Jesus said these words in Matthew 23, verse 33, O generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now outside the Hebrew community, of course, the morals of Gentile Rome prevailed. Let's take our Bibles and go back one chapter to Romans chapter 1. And notice the degrading influence of idolatry and hum, uh, perverted human wisdom that prevailed among them, which drew men farther and farther away from God's standard of righteousness. Listen to what Paul said of them, beginning in verse 22, Romans chapter 1. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They were steeped in idolatry. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. Look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. What a list. 
Yes, Paul proved both Jew and Gentile that they were all under sin, that there were none righteous, no, not one, Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. God had granted men long generations to demonstrate that by their own failure that they could not save themselves from the stain of sin. They could not improve their moral situation by their own wisdom or even by their own efforts by themselves. So in that dreadful plight, the world was prepared to receive Jesus Christ and his new morality. Now, the Son of God did what no man before or since has ever done. Jesus Christ lived up to the law of Moses perfectly without a single infraction. Peter said of Jesus that he knew no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law of Moses, Matthew 5, verse 17. And then he took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 then informs us and says that now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. His new covenant covers the entire spectrum of human conduct whether we're talking public or private, whether we're talking about worship or conduct, whether we're talking about dealings with God or dealings with man. God has left no man to himself to wonder how he should act or how he should even think. Now today, we have been given guidance. We are guided by the principles that are found in the New Testament, rather than by this great number of prohibitions or specific commandments like the old law Moses gave. In fact, Jesus gave a few basic principles by which we can measure every option and every deed that we do. Most of us are familiar with what we call the golden rule. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And this rule here regulates thousands of hard decisions concerning our human conduct. Jesus said, Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. That covers a lot. When weighing any action, we're reminded in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. What we do should be first and foremost in our mind as to how God looks at this. And will he accept it or will he not? When contemplating any question concerning worship or religious practices we are not to go beyond the things which are written first corinthians chapter 4 verse 6 in dress and in our public manners christians are to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety professing godliness with good works first timothy chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. in fact when you think about christ's law it actually lays a heavier responsibility upon the consciences of men than does the old law of Moses. Under the law of Moses, a person had to be born a Jew. In other words, you didn't have a choice as to whether you would be Jew or Gentile. But under the Christian law, everyone who becomes a Christian has to do so by personal choice. Under Moses, every single detail was spelled out but when Christianity was given and the law given to us, we draw conclusions from God-given principles that are lined out for us in the New Testament. For example, many people say, well, how much should I give? Well, to the Jew, Moses prescribed a tenth, Leviticus 27, verse 32. But to us Christians, we don't have a specific amount that we're told that we're to give. We're told that we're to give as we have been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 16, verse 2, and as we have purposed in our hearts, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. But there's no specific amount told us. But let me say this, that we will be held accountable as to whether we give sufficiently or not. But before we ever get the wrong idea, there are some moral absolutes and rules in the law of Christ. For example, Paul reminds us in Romans 13, verse 9, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost 
and commands that we are to repent and to be baptized in order to receive the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. We see Paul giving absolute restrictions in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, as he lists out the works of the flesh that we are to refrain from. What Christ's new morality sought to do was to eliminate the problem at the root. His law was a law of the mind and of the heart. Moses said, thou shalt not kill. Jesus goes as far as saying, he forbids anger against one's brother without cause because anger always precedes violence and murder. Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 and 22. The old law forbade adultery. Jesus forbids the lustful look that prepares the mind for such a sinful act. Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 and 28. Moses warns against breaking one's oath. Jesus said, swear not at all. Matthew 5, verses 33 and 34. The law said, love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for them, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. So Christ does have a law and is much more stringent, much more different than anything known before certainly different from the law of Moses. So let's look at some of the attributes of Christ's moral system in our lesson this morning. Now first of all, Christ's morality is revealed exclusively in the scriptures. You can't find this morality anywhere else. Neither nature, nor history, nor philosophy can provide a code of ethics that meets the needs of all men and nations of this world. Nothing in the history of mankind can even come remotely to the recorded moral code of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jeremiah the prophet said long ago in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man does not get his morality from himself. It comes from someplace else. And that's why Paul emphasizes to us in Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus says the wise disciple is the one who hears his word and does them, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And the reason is because these words of Christ are the ones we're going to have to answer to in the judgment, John 12, verse 48. <clears throat> I believe John Locke was correct when he said, To give a man full knowledge of true morality, I would send him to no other book than the New Testament. Our morality comes from the Word of God. And this, I think, is the reason why we have so many troubles in America today, because we have strayed so far from the Word. Now, the second attribute of Christ's morality is that it calls upon all men to be like Christ. Peter says that Christ left us an example that we should follow in his steps. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Paul challenges us to imitate him as he imitated Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. In fact, the very name Christian suggests that we be like Christ. We are Christians. Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, verse 48. So his morality calls for godliness to the very best of our ability, <clears throat> that we are to strive to be like him. The third attribute of Christ's morality is that it is to be lived and not just to be theorized. Philosophers and theologians often delight in speculation with absolutely no thought of practical application. But our Lord demands that we be doers of the word and not hearers only, James chapter 1, verse 22. And those who only hear the word, they're only deluding themselves. In the conclusion of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said there in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So we are to live the law and not just theorize it. Fourth, 
Christ's moral code is universal and age-lasting. Now, since all mankind has a common origin, since we all have a common set of problems, and we all have a common destiny in the fact that we're all going one of two places, then there has to be a common standard of righteousness. Now, Paul says that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us will give an account of himself unto God, Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. And therefore, the gospel of Jesus Christ is to pre be preached to every creature which is under heaven, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Christ's moral code is also based upon two great commandments. Remember when people came to Jesus and they, they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus gave them an answer there in Matthew chapter 20, 22, verses 37 through 39. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now to love God ultimately demands that everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think is to be subordinate to God's holy will. And that above all else, we are to desire to please him. And therefore, a Christian is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, verse 33. And we are to deny ourselves, we are to take up our cross daily and to follow him, Matthew 16, verse 24. Loving him means that we gladly keep his commandments, John 14, verse 15. They're not grievous to us. Loving our neighbor demands that we do the best or do what is best for them. And sometimes this means telling them what they need to hear and not necessarily what they want to hear. In every social conduct, we be carried out with this noble aim in mind, not the pleasing of the flesh, but the salvation of the soul. Christ's morality also demands self-restraint and control. As a Christian, I am expected to exercise self-control in my moral life. 1 Peter or 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 6. So I am to strive for a high level of moral conduct and not just because there's a prohibition there but because I am a child of God and I am here to show the world to whom I truly belong. Now as a preacher I am oftentimes pressured to give a list of do's and don'ts that people should and should not do. Like just how long should the skirt be? Or how much should I give? You know, one man once said this, to ask for such a list is the easy way out, but rules only draw boundaries. They do not give directions. They may keep people from going astray, but they don't lead people anywhere. We're not to depend upon someone to give us a list of do's and don'ts, but we are to rely upon the principles that are found in God's word as we rightly divide it. Now, Christ's morality also insists of, that I not just think of myself, but I consider how my conduct might affect others. To the Romans, Paul writes, Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died, Romans 14, verse 15. In the very next verse, he says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. A little later, in the same chapter, verse 21, he said, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. And if we forget this rule, we sin against our brethren, and we sin against Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. There is no room for reckless selfishness in Christ. We need to consider our actions and how people may think about them. And we should never bring reproach upon the name of Christ. The eighth thing about the morality of Jesus Christ is that it looks to heaven as our ultimate reward. Jesus taught us there in Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 20, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, 
and where thieves do not break through and steal. Reason is because our conversation is in heaven, from we, whence we look for the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 3.20. But you know, sometimes it is the lot of the Christian that our life may become very hard. And it may be through suffering and sorrow, or maybe persecution, poverty, maybe even ultimately death. And when hard times fall on Christians, sometimes a skeptic will look at you and say, well, where is your God? But you know, we're taught that whatever reward we have on this earth, whether good or bad, there is going to be a great reward. There's going to be great things for us in the world to come if we remain faithful to him. God has made that promise, and he is always true, and you can bet on his words. Yes, we can rejoice in the beatitude given by James, the brother of our Lord, in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord shall give to them that love him. And then finally, we see that the Lord's moral system proclaims a final day of judgment. And it will be then that all wrongs will be righted. Everything that we have sown, we are going to reap, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And that judgment is going to expose the very secrets of every man, Romans chapter 2, verse 16. It will be a righteous judgment because Jesus Christ will be the righteous judge, Acts 17, verse 30. And in that day, each and every one of us are going to hear one of two summons. We may hear these words, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. Or we can hear, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, 34. And what we hear really depends upon the preparation that we make while we are here in this life. Truly, the moral code of Jesus Christ has stood the test of time, and no other code has ever equaled the power to perform or to elevate men and nations. The reason is, is because this code comes from heaven and not from men. So I think that we can truly say with the psalmist, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desi desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, more than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Yeah, our reward is not some guesswork. Our reward is given to us right here in the books, the pages of the book of the Bible. The secret is found right here in God's word. You keep this and you can live eternally with God in heaven. You disregard it, you deny it, and you will suffer the second death. It's a choice we have to make. I hope that you will make the moral choice and follow after Jesus Christ. Obey him, whatever he says to do. If you're not a Christian and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that he truly is the son of God, then once you repent of your sins, as he's commanded in Luke 13, verse 3, confess his name before men, as he said to do in Matthew 10, 32, and be baptized in order to receive salvation, Mark 16, verse 16. These are the commands of Jesus Christ, if you want eternal life in heaven with him. And then he also tells us that we have to live faithfully if we want to receive that crown of life, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. If there's something missing in your life, if you have not submitted completely to the morality, the moral code of Jesus Christ, do you have the opportunity to make that change this morning? If we can help you in any way, whatever it may be, maybe you need the prayers of the congregation. We'd be glad to pray with you and for you. If there's anything we can do to help you this morning, won't you come while together we stand and sing?